I warmly welcome all participating state agents to the EAB's 2017 CPD program, which is being presented by uh, contact sessions, e-learning, and also a new innovation that we're hoping to launch in the second part of the 2017 year. I'm really gratified at the wholehearted support from professional state agents that the EAB continues to receive where CPD is concerned. The CPD requirement is prescribed by the EAB both as the statutory regulator of the sector and also in fulfillment of its professional body obligations. It is to be underscored that CPD is an ongoing process that will continue throughout the career of a professional estate agent. CPD indeed is essential for ensuring the continued knowledge, competence and retention of skills in any profession, including, of course, a state agency. It is axiomatic that the desired outcome of the major objective of any CPD program is threefold, namely, to protect the consuming public, to safeguard the professionalism of the sector, and to ensure that a successful professional career of choice for a state agents. It has always been self-evident to me that the state agency sector is a dynamic and continually evolving one. Remaining informed of and being conversant with such factors as the latest skills, knowledge and industry trends is therefore essential if real estate professionals are to remain relevant, meaningful and probably just as importantly successful. I am convinced that the EAB CPD program as it has developed over the past two years, is sufficiently focused to provide the necessary tools and content to ensure professional property practitioners are able thereby to develop and enhance their professional skill sets in relation to both long-term career plans and identify professional goals in an exciting career of choice. CPD is an essential mechanism that facilitates the demonstration by property practitioners of their ongoing commitment to keeping themselves informed of the sector best practice, whether for the benefit of the stakeholders, consumers, peers, and frequently current and potential future employers. In my experience, some of the many benefits attaching to the EAB CPD program include the fact that CPD ensures the capability of a state agency professionals to keep pace with current standards and developments within the estate agency sector. CPD ensures that practitioners maintain and enhance the competence, knowledge and skills needed to deliver a professional service to clients, stakeholders and the community at large. CPD ensures that the knowledge of professionals is always relevant and current and that practitioners are made aware of new developments and changing trends and directions in the state agency sector, bearing in mind the increasing frenetic space of change that is currently being experienced. CPD not only assists professionals in the sector to make a meaningful contribution to a state agency in general, but also to become more effective in the workplace so that they 
may advance their careers, move into new positions and ultimately lead, manage, influence, coach and mentor others entering into the sector. CPD helps property practitioners to remain interested and interesting by creating and focusing on potential new possibilities, knowledge and skills areas. CPD can inculcate a deeper understanding of the professionalism of a state agency sector and encourage a greater appreciation of the implications, aspects and impacts of the services rendered by property practitioners. Interactive CPD advances the body of knowledge and competencies within the estate agency profession. CPD invariably results in increased public trust, confidence in and respect for individual professionals in general as well as the estate agency profession in particular. CPD inevitably contributes to improved consumer protection as well as a sustainable increase in the economy as a whole. It must be accepted that CPD represents a career-long obligation for all practicing estate agency professionals. I believe that on a cost-benefit analysis, there can be little doubt that the benefits accruing both to estate agents and the consumers they serve resulting from the professionalization of the sector far outweigh the cost that are necessarily incurred. The EAB, with this in mind, will continue to strive to ensure that CPD compliance is not regarded as an onerous obligation imposed upon state agents, but rather as a meaningful and valuable learning experience that provides food for thought and further inquiry and research while simultaneously enhancing the professionalism, competencies and productivity of property practitioners. I am confident that our CPD program for 2017 will meet these goals and obligations. In conclusion, I extend my very best wishes for the prosperity and success to our professional practitioners in 2017. I hope and trust that they will find CPD to be interesting, relevant and helpful as they continue to play their vital part in advancing the professionalism of their careers in the estate agency sector. Good day. Welcome to the legal update presented on behalf of the Estate Agency Affairs Board for your continual professional points. My name is Rick Redinger. I'm from the firm MC van der Berg Incorporated in Centurion Gauteng. Why do we need to look at case law? Case law is regarded as one of the branches of our South African law system. Case law works on a precedented system. When we look at the precedent system, we have to distinguish between superior and lower courts. Superior courts are regarded as the Constitutional Court, the highest court in the country, followed by the Supreme Court of Appeal, and then any other high courts in its various divisions. The judgments of these courts need to be followed. Lower courts are regarded as the regional and district courts. These judgments do not need it to be followed. The precedent system in South Africa is based on the legal principle of stare decisis, which means to adhere to decided cases. Judicial decisions by superior courts are authoritative and need to be followed by any lower courts. Let's look at this pyramid. District courts and regional courts in the bottom are regarded as lower courts. They need to, def need to follow decisions made by the High Court. The High Court of thereupon needs to follow the decisions made by the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court of Appeal needs to follow decisions made by the Constitutional Court. All three of the latter are regarded as superior courts. Marriage versus cohabitation was decided in Stain versus Hasse in the Western Cape High Court. The facts of this case, Mr. Stain and Ms. Hasse were in a cohabitation relationship. Please keep in mind they were not married. Their relationship lasted for around about four years and they were settled down in Somerset West. Ms. Hasse was a German foreigner, lived in Germany and also were married according to the German laws. Mrs. Stein was basically his mistress in South Africa. The relationship deteriorated and they split. Mr. Hasse tried to get rid of Mrs. Stein out of the property. Mrs. Stein thereupon counterclaimed on the application entitled to certain of the aspects which is normally between a husband and wife in a valid marriage. The judgment of this case, the court decided that it is a cohabitation. A cohabitation is regardless of the gen gender of people living together, but they still remain not married. By law, do, they do not have the same rights as married people, with certain rights and obligations between themselves. 
The court furthermore looked at Mrs. Stein's contribution that it might be a universal partnership, and the court said for a universal partnership to be present, contributions by both parties for the joint benefit with the object to make a profit need to be present. This was not the case in Mr. Sain's situation. The court furthermore said that contractually they could have regulated the position should the should their relationship deteriorate at a later stage. What we can take out of this in South Africa is that people that are not married cannot be regarded as married. Regardless of a cohabitation agreement, regardless of the duration of the relationship, there is no rights and obligations as in terms of matrimonial property regime for married people. Subdivision of agricultural land, Four Arrows Investment 68 versus Abigail Construction was discussed and decided in the Supreme Court of Appeal in South Africa. The background to this case, in terms of the Subdivision of Agricultural Land Act, I'm going to refer to that as SAL. The purpose of the SAL is to control and prevent that agricultural useful land should not be fragmented by subdivision into uneconomic portions. This includes the physical subdivision or undivided portions thereof to two persons or more. The SAL prohibits, without the prior consent from the Minister, that no advertisement or sale agreements can be entered into. Previously, there was a possible solution. The ministerial consent were made a suspensive condition in the agreement of sale, but this were overturned in the Q versus Van der Lith Supreme Court of Appeal decision in 2004. The court decided that making the ministerial consent a suspensive condition is irregular and it should be prohibited. And it is prohibited, therefore, by the Act. An inventive possible possibility were to make it an option by giving the prospective purchase an option to purchase the property after the ministerial consent has been obtained. Enter into a valid contract, even with the suspensive condition for the minister's approval. Secondly, even if it's an option for the proposed subdivision thereof, or more than one person, the minister's consent first needs to be obtained. Tips. Do a deed search. If agricultural land or agricultural holding, be aware. Only one buyer. If there's more than one buyer, consider that a close corporation, a company or a trust be created in order to purchase the property. Please note that spouses that are married in community of property can both purchase the property as they have one estate. If it's a proposed subdivision, first obtain the ministerial consent. Remember, even doing so before the property is advertised and before the contract is entered. Does trust asset fall into a potential divorcee's estate? We're going to look at the case of WT versus KT and Supreme Court of Appeal. WT <coughs> registered a trust while he was still unmarried and he transferred a property into that trust. WT and married KT at a later stage in community of property after the creation of the trust. WT and KT instituted divorce proceedings. Katie claimed that the estate needs to split 50-50. Katie also claimed 50% of the assets of the trust. She regarded that the assets of the trust forms part of the communal estate. In the court of first instance, the High Court of Pretoria, the judgment in the first court, the lower court, which is the High Court in this case, decided that the trust assets do form part of the joint estate and that KT is entitled to 50% of the trust assets. WT appealed to the Supreme Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Appeal said that the WT and KT never owned the trust assets in 50-50% shares. The trust was established before the marriage, the property purchased before the marriage and registered into the name of the trust, KT never assisted financially towards the trust, and Section 12 of the Trust, of the trust Property Control Act places that the, trust, that the trustee do not have the trust assets in his personal capacity. KT is not entitled to 50% of the trust assets. Another trust asset dispute, YB versus SB, decided in the Western Cape High Court. YB and SB were married out of community of property with their accrual system. YB wanted to divorce SB, YB has assets in a trust. 
its entire estate. It's been said that the, trust is, that, that the assets in the trust is in fact Wabi's personal assets. The assets should form part of the accrual system. In the judgment, the judge, the judge decided that the trust form was abused. The trustee or founder of the trust is his alter ego. The court pierced the trust veil. It could find that the trust assets belonging to the trustee was indeed his personal assets. In this case, the court found that the assets acquired in the trust simulated that of YB's personal estate assets and should form part of the accrual. SP is there to, therefore entitled to the trust assets. Cancellation of a contract. Makakati versus Larry decided in the Western Cape High Court. Larry sold his property to Makakati. The relevant terms of this case facts was that the purchase price was 600,000 Rand. The contract had a condition saying that 300,000 Rand should be paid as a deposit and the balance on request. Requests were made for the balance. <coughs> the facts of this case was that Larry sold his property to Makakati. The relevant terms of the offer to purchase, the relevant terms of the agreement was that the purchase price is 600,000 Rand. A 300,000 Rand deposit were, pay were payable immediately and the balance upon request. Cost to the transaction needed to be paid by the purchaser, Makakati. It furthermore contained a breach clause that if one, either one of the parties are in breach, a seven days notice period to rectify such breach was present. Makakati paid his 300,000 Rand deposit and a, furthermore to, uh, and a further 200,000 Rand. Upon request, he does not pay the balance of 100,000 Rand and transfer cost. The conveyance places Makakati on terms, in terms of the breach clause, seven days to perform. If non-payment is received, the seller, the seller instructed the conveyancer to cancel the contract. Makakati asked for an extension. The conveyancer, upon his, upon his client, the seller's instruction, refused such extension. Makakati pays 100,000 Rand after a seven-day period. The conveyancer sends a letter to confirm cancellation. Larry then go and sell the property to a third party. Makakati approaches the court asking for immediate relief so that Larry transfers the property into his name. <coughs> Makakati said <coughs> that Larry cannot cancel the contract immediately. The judge came down with the decision that after the seven day period, the right to cancel is indeed there for Larry. Late payment by Makakati does not nullify this right of the seller. Larry can select to cancel or proceed with the transaction on his own discretion. From the action inference can be made that Larry indeed opted to cancel the contract by selling the property to a third party. A cancellation letter after payment is still valid. Mandate dispute. Lushaka Investments Propriety Limited versus JHI Properties Propriety Limited decided in the Johannesburg High Court. Lushaka Properties granted an exclusive mandate to JHI. In that period, Lushaka accepts an offer from another estate agency, Prenny Brothers. JHI sues Lushaka for damages. Please keep in mind they sued for damages, not for commission. The damage claim was equal to the amount of commission. The court ruled that Lushaka rendered it impossible for JHR to execute its mandate by accepting an offer from Penny Brothers. JHR is entitled to damages but not commission, as claimed. Damages are indeed equal to commission. Let's look at commission claims. For a commission claim to succeed, the estate agent must be the effective or dominant cause of the sale. The nature and effect of an estate agent's eff effort and time is considered, but not the amount thereof. Proof that the estate agent's actions constituted the cause of sale are therefore required. A mere introduction of the purchaser to a property must lead to a successful sale. Attendance of negotiations between a buyer and a seller is not necessarily the effective cause of the transaction. If more than one competing agent is present, there is no rule that the closing agent is therefore the effective cause of the sale. Terms of the sale and terms of the mandate are weighed against each other. 
Discrepancies in, in the two documents can indicate that the introducing agent is not necessarily the effective cause of the transaction. A mere reduction of commission to close the transaction does not necessarily mean that that agent was the effective cause of the transaction. If an agent introduced a buyer to a property and the buyer rent and later purchased the property privately from the seller, the initial introduction by the estate agent can be the effective cause of that sale. Tips. Determining the effective cause is not easy. It could have been avoided by explaining the possible pitfalls to the seller that if more than one estate agent markets the property, there might be a, uh, there might be a collusion of double commission. Please advise your sellers to contact the agent if the same client views the property through different agencies. There's a duty on the seller if the purchaser's agent receives secret commission. Attorney's Fidelity Fund Board of Control versus Interbarn Immediates in the Pretoria High Court. The facts of this case reads like a horror. AFF required new officers and appointed Interbane as consultants for the procurement thereof. Interbane's representative and Dyer, Dyer was the executive of the Attorney's Fidelity Fund, were neighbours and pushed for a transaction in a corrupt manner. Interbane and Dyer inflated the purchase price with 17,18%, the latter to be shared between them. The latter equals to an amount of 5.5 million rand. The seller signed a non-disclosure secret commission agreement that he only wanted 32 million rand for the property and everything that the property could be sold for over and above 32 million rand will be for the benefit of Interbane and Dyer. A transaction between Room, the seller and the AFF for 37.5 million rand were concluded. It later came to light that the purchase price were indeed inflated. The AFF instituted action that they were misrepresented towards the true purchase price of the property and claimed the 17.18% commission back as damages suffered for inflating the purchase price. Judgment in this case said that Interbarn Immediates, being the purchaser's representative, should have disclosed to the AFF that they have a financial benefit in the transaction. The seller also have a duty to disclose the commission to the purchaser on the following basis. Firstly, the seller knew Interbane and Dyer colluded to inflate the purchase price for own financial enrichment, which therefore comes down to fraudulent misrepresentation. Courts are reluctant to impose a legal duty for an omission based on the principle that each party should mind its own business. But when the legal convictions of society dictates otherwise, there is a duty to disclose and that is in the case of fraud and misrepresentation. The actions of Interbane and Dyer amounted to fraud and corruption in terms of the Combating of Corrupt Activities Act 12 of 2004. This case reads like a horror for good business practices. If you are underhanded with a commission structure and fraudulently persuading a party to conclude the contract, corruption and fraud will not be tolerated when it comes to light by our courts. What are the requirements to have a contract rectified? Tamron Manor Propriety Limited versus Stand 1192 Johannesburg Propriety Limited decided in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Stand 1192 Johannesburg Propriety Limited sold the property to Tamron Manor Propriety Limited for an amount of 3.2 million rand. A certain author signed the contract, although he was never authorized in doing so on behalf of Tamron Manor. Tamron Manor complied with all the conditions of the contract. Stand 1192 Propriety Limited refused to effect transfer on the basis that the contract is invalid. Otto was never authorised to sign on behalf of Tamron Manor. Tamron Manor approached the court asking a relief to force Stand 1192 Propriety Limited to effect transfer of and rectify the agreement that Tamron Manor is indeed the true purchaser. Judgment. The, court, the first court of instance ruled in favour of Stand 1192 Propriety Limited that the agreement is indeed invalid, non-compliance with Section 2.1 of the Alienation of Land Act, ALA hereafter. The Supreme Court of Appeal dissected Section 2.1 in this case in order to grant rectification. 
The Supreme Court of Appeal dissected Section 2.1 of the Alienation of Land Act in order to grant the rectification of the contract. Firstly, they looked at, was the formal requirements met in terms of Section 2.1? That means, was the agreement reduced to writing, was it signed by the parties there too, or by the agents acting on their written authority? First, does the contract constitute a valid agreement on face value? If it, does, if it does, the second consideration can be considered. Was a proper case for rectification made out? The seller and purchaser were identified as well as the object sold and the agreed purchase price. These are the essential elements for a valid agreement. The Supreme Court of Appeal held that the contract is permissible of being rectified. The requirements of Section 2.1 is very strict indeed. A court case could have been prevented if the, estate, if the agent, Otto, was indeed authorised by way of a resolution to do so. One paid for the property, the other is the registered owner. Who is entitled to the property? Grounds versus Mjogolo, decided in the Eastern Cape High Court. Mr. Grouse, a foreigner, was married out of community of property to Mrs. Mjogolo, a South African. Mjogolo convinced Grouse that the foreigners can't be property owners in terms of South African law and therefore cannot take ownership of the, of the property. Mr. Grouse exclusively paid for the property. The marriage later broke down and Mjogolo was in the process of selling the property. Grouse approached the High Court to interdict Mjogolo from selling the property, possibly leaving him out of pocket. The court granted the interdict against Diogolo for selling the property on the following basis, that once they are on tra trial, Grouse might prove that Diogolo fraudulently, fraudulently misrepresented the fact that he cannot be an owner of the property in, South Af in terms of South African law. He has a direct and a substantial interest in the property because Ndjogolo made no financial contribution towards it. Real estate ownership in our law remains very much secured, unless a party fraudulently misrepresent, misrepresent the facts to gain unlawfully out of the transaction. Our courts will protect the party's interest there too by granting such interdicts. The Sectional Title Management Act, 9 of 2011. Please keep in mind that the Sectional Titles Act 95 of 1986, STA year after, is still applicable. Conveyances will still open sectional title schemes in terms of this Act. Normal transfer of sectional title units will still be regulated by the Sectional Titles Act. The Sectional Titles Management Act became operative on the 7th of October 2016. It regulates that all sectional title schemes must be registered with the Community Schemes Ombud Services within 30 days before the 6th of November 2016. All schemes must lodge those with must, must lodge the all schemes must lodge their rules with CSOS within 90 days before the 5th of January 2017. All schemes must file their annual returns and financial statements within four months from financial year end of that scheme. All schemes must pay their prescribed fees to the CSOS on a quarterly basis from the 5th of January 2017. All schemes must be insured. Schemes need to, need, schemes need to notify CSOS, the municipality and the registrar of deeds of their domicile address. Schemes are to establish a reserve fund, a separate bank account and annual, annual budget, budgets and maintenance plans delivered to CSOS. The Sectional Title Management Act 9 of 2011 are there to provide standard sectional title rules and to regulate improvements and amendments to those rules. The management of sectional title schemes are in terms of the Sectional Titles Management Act. Complaints through the... <coughs> so nine, five, four, three. The Act furthermore makes it... The Act furthermore makes provision that complaints can be... Can be adhere to dispute resolution. Disputes for conciliation and adjudication are therefore entailed in this Act. The Community Schemes Ombud Services Act. 
amending section of title rules must be approved by the CSOS. The Community Schemes Ombud Services Act look at various issues. If there is a financial issue, for example insurance, levies, audits, payments and rental, behavioural issues, for example nuisance, animals, removal of articles or objects, or scheme govern governance issues for new provisions, invalid provisions, unreasonable provisions, or meeting issues, and for example an annual general meeting, uh, an invalid meeting, and any form of resolutions can be referred to the Community Schemes Ombud in order for it to adjudicate on those kind of issues. The Management Services Act makes the management services are for the contract of the, of the agent appointed by the scheme, works in private and common areas, example repairs, acquiring property and exclusive use areas, or general and other information or orders made by the Ombud. It requires a scheme for the body corporate to have reserve funds equal to 25% of the total levies. All buildings are to be insured against standard risk, earthquakes, earthquakes and subsidence. Schemes need to lodge a 10-year maintenance plan for repair and replacements. The Community Scheme Ombud will keep copies of all relevant documents and provide rules to new owners and tenants upon request. All schemes, to pay the levies, all schemes need to pay a levy to CSOS. The levy fee of CSOS is equal to 2% of all levy amounts above 500 Rand per month with a maximum cap of 40 Rand for levies exceeding 2,500 Rand per month to a body corporate. No levies payable to CSOS, CSOC if the monthly levy is not exceeding 500 Rand per month or the owner or tenant has a net income of below 5,500 Rand. To indicate again, the first 500 Rand for body corporate levies are exempted from CSOS levies zero rand will be payable and then 2% to a maximum of 40 rand for over and above 2,500 rand monthly levies payable. Thank you for your time. Please remember to complete your 10 multiple choice questions in order to obtain your CPD points. Thank you.